Ladies and gentlemen, the program is about to begin. Please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. We would like to remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the theater. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sham Rahman, Marketing Manager for the New York Times Live Conversation and Performance Series Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, fashion, literature, and science. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, which is part of our Times Talks Downtown series presented by Cadillac. I hope you will all join us for a cocktail reception, compliments of Cadillac following this evening's program. <laughs> Tonight, we're thrilled to welcome award-winning actors Rose Byrne and Chris O'Dowd, stars of, Sun of the Sundance sensation Juliet Naked and the film's director Jesse Peretz. In this adaptation of Nick Hornby's novel, Byrne plays Annie, who has an unlikely transatlantic romance with her boyfriend O'Dowd's musical obsession, the once revered, now faded singer-songwriter Tucker Crow. You will hear much more about tonight's guests and their upcoming project from our moderator, Logan Hill, veteran New York Times contributor. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Rose, Chris, Jesse, and Logan. Everybody. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? Um, we're going to talk up here for a little bit, and then we'll pass the microphone around about 40 minutes in. So think of your own questions, and I'll call on you later. Um, this is you were just saying. This is like the victory lap, right? I, this is, this yeah, is the grand finale. It's all been building this final interview. Yeah. We had hoped that this would be the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, that it would be you, mm -hmm. and then we'd all just kind of disintegrate. <laughs> you know that Mercury is in retrograde. Is anybody oh. familiar with this? People have been telling me this horse shit all day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I need to buy a new laptop. I lost my laptop. And they're like, well, don't, not this week. Yeah. <laughs> don't buy a laptop this week. <laughs> I'm like, why? Oh, well, Mer Mercury's in metric. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. This How, is how's that going to affect opening weekend box office? Do the astrologists have an opinion about this? Say that again? Uh, how does, uh, the, what do the astrologists think of uh, Mercury in retrograde on opening weekend box office? Is that a yeah. good sign, a bad sign? I think we're confident either way. It, it seems <laughs> it, the movie is so good that it defies any kind of demographic. It's going to transcend the solar system. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It is, well, it is a great movie, and we're really happy to have you guys here. Um, I saw the film at Sundance and walked out of it thinking, I want to talk to you guys about this movie, because there's so much to talk about. Um, we have love and obsession on the front co cover of your uh, programs and the invites, and we'll talk about love and obsession. <laughs> yeah. um, but also, it's, it has a lot of interesting things uh, to say about art and how we get obsessed with art. Um, and so I thought we'd start, we've got a few clips we'll show you to give you a little taste of the film. Um, we'll go ahead and roll one. Um, that's straight from the beginning of the film, so I don't think we need to set it up at all. All right. Cool. Hello. Welcome to Can You Hear Me? Your source for all things Tucker Crow. If you're here, you're probably already a fan of Tucker's music. But if you're merely Crow curious, or you clicked on the link by accident, allow me to introduce you to one of the most seminal and yet unsung figures of alternative rock. Although Tucker started writing songs in his early teens, his real breakthrough was the release of the 1993 album, Juliet. The whole film doesn't take place in the... On video. <laughs> on, video. <laughs> on an Apple um, computer camera. 
Um, although that is a different, there was, wasn't there, I think there was one at Sundance this year that was all sort of YouTube uh, yeah. stories in our Oh, is that right? So it's not, this isn't that movie. No. No. <laughs> um, Jesse, you had the, the wild idea to adapt a Nick Hornby novel. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, I wish that I could answer that question saying like, oh, it, like it was my idea it to was. do it. It was, I definitely came into a project that was, um, were producers that already had the book and there was already uh, a draft of the script that had been slaved over for a bit of, um, for some time. Um, but I, uh, but I got sent the script and, um, and I, and I really liked it a lot and then I read the novel and I um, really fell in love with the novel and I saw a slightly different version of the movie than the script that I'd read and that's sort of where we kind of set out to make that movie and of course kept tweaking what that story was right up to, to the very end, as you often do. Rose, for the last time on this press tour, would you mind explaining like kind of the basic arc of the film? Oh, I'm so, I'm not, are you better? Or Chris, you want to try Chris? Like, I'm so not great at like... I have faith in you. <laughs> I have faith in you. You do? Yeah. yeah. Quick, Jesse? I have faith in you. Oh my god. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, um, uh, um, Annie, uh, my character Annie, is, has been with Duncan for 15 years. They live in a seaside village in England. He's obsessed with Tucker Crow, played by um, Ethan Hawke. And uh, he's a bit like a Jeff Buckley type, has had an iconic album, but, but then vanished. And he has a room devoted in the house to Tucker Crow, which is already like problematic. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Um, and then lo and behold, we get this random uh, uh, CD with these unplugged versions of songs from this album. And uh, I go, uh, we have a huge argument about it because he thinks it's brilliant and I think it's dreary. And I go online and. In a, in a protest, really, about the relationship, Annie writes this scathing review. Like, scathing, <laughs> scathing review. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's already playing well. And exactly. Of, of these songs. And, um, and then, lo and behold, Tucker Crow emails Annie saying, I couldn't agree more. All the best, Tucker Crow. And then starts this kind of life-changing, series of life-changing events for them as a couple. And, and his, his literally the I best like breakdown of the film. I, yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Um, so Thank you yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it Jesse, is a love story, which doesn't really sound like that when I say <laughs> Yeah, and it's also sort of a broken love story. Too. It is, so, so yeah. Jesse, you had to cast two actors thinking they're going to be believable as a couple, but not, they're not going to get along so great that everyone's going to want to see them work out perfectly, yeah. right? They get no. along, but not too well. Uh, Wow, I feel so loud. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I definitely think like I definitely think we had we had those concerns because Chris is so damn linkable that even though even though his, his actual uh, his actual life that he lives in the in the movie is sort of insufferable, you you can't help but to somehow think, oh, maybe the audience is still going to want her to um, end up back with him. But we just had we we had faith. <laughs> well, because that's, Chris, I mean, that has been your, uh, often how you crop up in films like Bridesmaid as just sort of the, the charming, you know, the, you read profiles of you and everyone used the word every man and this is a thing we read all the time. How do you, how do, was it, are you, with this and Get Shorty, it seems like you've been uh, open to roughing that up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, playing unlikable characters is definitely more fun mm -hmm. because they're, the jokes are better <laughs> uh, in a way you can be more dastardly or... Um, like the idea of a charming character playing a charming character in, in essence isn't that interesting to play really because it's, it's, it's trying to be likable and that's what I do in the rest of my bloody life <laughs> as we all do in a way is trying to make people like us and, and it's you know a, 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 you know, one of the consequences of being alive. <laughs> um, but then it's fun to play a character where you're like, I don't care if anybody is, wants to like this person or wants to marry this person or be <laughs> with them. I can, it's much more fun in, in something like Get Shorty where it's like, oh, it's fun to like intimidate someone. Mm -hmm. And in, someone, in something like this where it's like, I can actually get to the nuts and bolts of this uh, obsession thing is quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, it's something I'm familiar with, the idea of 
people who are obsessed. And we've been talking about this a little over the last few days. And we have become something of a culture of um, you are what you like, rather than you are how you behave or how you feel, even. And so you can kind of ring fence your personality into this list of things that you've watched and listened to over the course of the last few weeks. And it somehow um, abdicates you from emotion. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think increasingly that's uh, the male gaze. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Like th th there's something particularly particular about guys that tend to do that. I think so because genu generally we're not as connected emotionally, um, and of course these are all massive generalizations. But, <laughs> uh, but we're, you know, it, it's it's not been something that's been um, taught to us as something that's very necessary um, to be emotionally connected at all times. That it's you know, and and now when we're like, well, you need to be a good person, and you need to be. Um, you need to be smart or you need to be whatever, then you can pick things. Like you can just go, well, this is a writer or this is a, a poet or this is a, a, a singer, sing songwriter who was very in touch with his emotions. Mm -hmm. And if I say I like him, then that makes me that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have the three of you ever done that? Have you ever caught yourself in that kind of loop where you become obsessed with one person in that way? For sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I, mean, I grew up in Sydney, in Australia, in the 90s, and Kylie Minogue was uh. <laughs> the pop princess. And as a 10-year-old girl, I had wall-to-wall -wall posters of Kylie Minogue and one poster of one other poster, which was Dead Poets Society. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> pretty cute. Um, and I'm pretty sure I told Ethan that. Oh, that's um, great. And, but I went to her concerts for four or five times. So I made my father drag, dragged him along to these. And she's a not national treasure in Australia. And she's a cancer survivor. She's brilliant and a great pop star. But that was, I still remember the, obsess, the obsession I had with her as a young girl in Sydney, Australia. So what do you think, I mean, <laughs> if we're talking about that emotional connection you have, where you're identifying with someone, you see something of yourself in them. What did you see of yourself in Kylie Minogue? In Kylie? Where do I begin? I mean, <laughs> we, <laughs> I guess in Aust Australia is very it's contained. You know, we don't have that many idols. We don't have that many pop stars or that many things. And uh, she just blew up. She was very girl next door. She was so charming and appealing. She was bubbly and um, her pop songs were really great. They were like great pop songs. And the whole package, she was on this huge television show that was like watched throughout Australia. and. Um, this is that hot, the whole package of her sort of fun, lively yeah. attitude and her popularity just just took off. And yeah, I guess there was something about that that I, I just wanted to be. Yeah, and loved her music. I loved to dance and sing and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. And Jesse, for you, I mean, by college, so you're really cool. I'm really cool. really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Tortured and ironic. Like, I like you know the old rock band from you know, South Dakota. Cool. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to say? You are. You're going to say the. I don't know where you're going with your question. Oh, I was going to say, you know, by by college, you're sort of you're a rock star yourself, right? You're um you're playing the Lemonheads and, and things are going well uh, before. I would. I was just saying a rock star is a bit a bit of an exaggeration, but I would. But I. But I. Yes, I was in a band, and I and I definitely. Um, I definitely knew the joys of like being on stage and feeling the um, whatever that that like thrill of people's attention. Even though, I think I always felt like a fraud because I really I was definitely not a good enough musician to um, be as lucky as I was to be touring around playing music. I was a very functional at best bass player, but. But did you have a musician you were obsessed with before all that start, took off? For and sure. Happening? I mean, you know, many of them. I mean, it's funny when you were talking about Kylie Minogue. You know, when I think of myself actually like younger, I mean, this is not the, you know, this is not the answer that I would say is, um, you know, my my more kind of teenage or like early twenties like obsessions were probably like Alex Shelton and Big Star were the kind of equivalent of. Um, 
of Duncan's, like Tucker Crow, um, in terms of just like it was hard to get information about Alex Chilton, and he seemed like enigmatic and both really vulnerable and sarcastic, and like had all the combinations of the things, kind of like you were saying, that you wish that you had the ability to kind of express both like um, incredibly sweet, vulnerable um, emotions, and then like very witty, sarcastic. Right. Um, but I will say, like my first, my first insane. Um, Obsession to the point of like writing letters and whatever was um, when I was in like seventh like seventh grade. What does that make you? Uh, Eleven or yeah, something. 11, 12, I was obsessed with Joan Armatrading, and I actually like <laughs> wrote, I was obsessed with all of wow. her like really earnest songs and um, bottom to the definitely top. like when my sister took her took me to the Orpheum. It was my introduction my introduction to lesbianism. Like I was like super, my mind was blown by being like one of like seven males. <laughs> but anyways, I, I love Joan Armour training. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she would say she's the one like you went down the rabbit hole like memorizing Oh yeah, lyrics. I wrote her like letters. What would be I, like, the letters? What were you writing? I fantasized about someday like being able to be like the guitarist in her band and I would get excited that I would see that there were different guitarists on all the records like that made me feel like it's not she doesn't have stay. <laughs> I mean I I definitely went there in my um, mm -hmm. like she was gonna rotate you through it's gonna you're gonna be ready I thought gonna... it might be a possibility yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how about you Chris did you ever have the posters on your wall the the person you were obsessed with becoming well, I mean, I, as a, a teenager, I think I was a, uh, if, if obsessed might be too strong a word, but I was really into the band Oasis, which was right in my kind of wheelhouse of teenage angst. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of um, second generation Irish guys, and I felt like they're taking over the world, and there's something they felt so angry, and I got that. And then, but in terms of things that, and I'd seen them a few times, but I don't know if I'd ever, if I would ever have called it actually obsessed. The only thing that I ever felt that I did was a fan obsession was actually a New York theater company called Labyrinth when I was 20 or 21 and just kind of finishing up drama school. I became obsessed with this company that, like, Philip Seymour Hoffman was the artistic director of at the time, and there was this writer called Stephen Aldegrigus who's still doing great work. Um, John Ortiz and Ron Cephas Jones and all these great actors who um, I saw a play called Jesus Hop the A-Train in London and I was like, oh, that's all I've ever wanted is to like, be in a play like that. And they were doing it and so I saw everything they made and I was working in a bar at the time and saved all of my money to fly to New York to see their newest play, which was Our Lady of 121st Street. And it, I didn't have enough money to pay rent, but I had enough money for a plane ticket. <laughs> so that felt like the only thing that I was like, oh, that's quite, that, in retrospect, felt totally normal at the time, but now it's probably quite obsessive. I remember right around that same time I, I was working at New York Magazine, my first job in the city was, a, was covering theater downtown. Uh -huh. And I called up Phil Hoffman for an interview, and um, he picks up the phone going, Labyrinth Theater? And uh, oh my God! He was taking ticket orders. He had, oh my I think, God! Town of Mr. Ripley had just opened, you know, <laughs> yeah. recently. And he answering was still the phones. Answering uh, the phones, and he had to interrupt our interview about four times. Say, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Just, oh just a second, and I would hear him <laughs> taking credit card numbers over the phone, uh, taking all the orders. They had this uh, communal spirit in the theater where everyone had to take turns yeah. doing all the jobs. Oh, oh my God! Was oh, that's so, so awesome. great. <laughs> yeah. that's so great. Um, but the flip side of this obsession is sometimes it makes you a terrible boyfriend. And I, and I feel like I've, I've known, I've, I've been friends with people who have broken up with guys because they were obsessed with German techno or because, they, you know, because the obsession <laughs> grew so big and horrible that it made them insufferable in the way. I feel like that's a very it. specific friend in your life. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I am thinking of a particular friend. Yeah, I feel yeah. like Jan. He's <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably still single, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. um, did 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 that? Have you have you encountered those people in your life? Who you think uh, you know, especially in this business, I feel like you must constantly run into folks. Some of them journalists, probably, who are um, unhealthily obsessed about particular folks. I, I, 
I guess, yeah. I mean, I, not even journalists, but like, I, I, I still meet like men like my age who are so upset. Like, not necessarily in art all the time, but uh, like sports people, oh, yeah. like yeah. people who are like, and I imagine Bobby. Yeah, oh, Bobby will talk about like a baseball <laughs> player for forty-five minutes, and I've got <laughs> no idea what <laughs> who he's talking about, and I'm just like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's still trying to convert you to, to baseball? Yeah, totally. Like, he's still got he's hope? Very, you know, he's a, he'll, he gets you in here, he's very passionate, and so he'll just, you know, and often a lot of them are Cuban, and he's Cuban, so there's a the whole thing, it's a very cultural thing, and um, yeah, but he goes on, he goes on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or when my wife hears me talking to like my best mate on the phone, and she's like, wow, that was so in, such an in-depth conversation. Like, what were you talking about? And I was like, oh, we were talking about fantasy football. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, what's fantasy football? And I couldn't bring it to explain it. Like, it was too embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> to be like, it's not even about the actual sport, really. <laughs> it's about, like, our interpretation of how everybody is going to perform <laughs> in the following week. And we were on the phone for a while, like, good, you know, again, like yeah. 45 minutes. Yeah. And for three minutes of that, it's like, how's the wife and kids? Great. So listen. <laughs> 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 you know, how do you think that, like, Sergio Aguero, some, like, <laughs> like Argentinian striker is going to perform the following week? So I get it. It's, it's like, so what, do, you, do you have Trump cards here? Oh, he's really ruined even that term, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> <like cool>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, you've got, you've got Trump cards, is that sometimes I can't remember if that's a thing that's everywhere. I Trump cards are know. like, you buy a thing, like they're cards for children, and you're like, oh, my dinosaur is bigger than oh, your yeah. dinosaur. And essentially, at like the age of 38, um, you do that still with like <laughs> football. And it's, I guess that's obsessive because it's so irrational. I bet they to... rename trump cards now. They're going to have to call them something else so we don't set them on fire. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh. Pokemon and yeah. We we um I'm curious about that that line this film kind of questions what that line is right between a sort of a healthy enthusiasm you know or an adorable uh you know passion for something and then for an obsession that, that hurts your relationships. I almost, yeah. well, how would you define that line or where that exists? Is it kind of like alcoholism? Like as long as it's not interfering with your job and your <laughs> relationships, it's... That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I think if you've got a room devoted to the person, then that's a really drawing line. Not ideal. Like, you yeah. know, that's not ideal. Not it's ideal. like where's your... No shrines. You know, your boyfriend, he's downstairs in if you're a room over, devoted to If you're over 35. This, yeah, and you're over 35, <laughs> exactly. Like that's... There is a moment in the film, in the, in, the, in the first act of the film, which is quite telling as to why our relationship isn't going well, I suppose, where um, Tucker Crow releases a new album. And I get the sense that um, Annie um, doesn't like it. And so I go downstairs into the basement and get on my computer. And I tell her that I need to be with people who get it because this is important to me, and I don't want to be around her right now. And that's, that's probably too far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the scene that Nick Hornby helped us with. That's right. Yeah. That's what it was. We were and talking that was about exactly, And that was like exactly his point. Yes. Sorry, we're, we're continuing an earlier interview. <laughs> you need, like, and, and it wasn't working, and you had to try to solve a problem with that scene? Yeah. We, um, it was like a it was like a two line scene in the script that probably should have been left as is, but um, nonetheless, we decided somehow we thought you know what this this is too important a moment and we're not really getting the important like thing that's happening to their relationship right in this that's moment right. where and and so we were trying so so we were kind of on set with the whole crew there trying to kind of rewrite it and figure out like how do we really like land to say what we wanted to say and um it, it was really the one day in the whole shoot where just like we all were just super choking and it just felt hot and there was a crew just staring at us as yeah. we tried yeah. to figure it out things got a little heated and you know there was there was definitely arguments going on nothing like major it was very kind of a happy set but we were being a little terse with each other 
<laughs> and at some point I said something like, none of this makes any fucking sense. And at that point, somebody like behind the camera said, hello. <laughs> and that was the first time we met Nick Hornby. <laughs> First time you met no, I met Nick Horn, <laughs> sorry. He had, you guys had met him. I had come on to the job a bit late because um, we'd had a baby and stuff. And, um, but yeah, so the first time <laughs> that I met Nick Hornby, the writer of the thing, of the book, was me going, none of this makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and so then, then Jesse was like, I think we should just have lunch now, which was, you know, very mature. And so we kind of, um, we took a break, and then I was, I felt like, oh, God, I'm such a dick. Uh, but then <laughs> Nick helped us write, like, yeah. the writer's kind of and, way out of the problem. And that was exactly, and he, that was exactly his thought, because that was exactly how he phrased it. He was, he said, you know, at a time where you're, where something so important is happening about yeah. something you care so much about, the last thing you want to do is spend that time with someone who doesn't understand yes. it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and he said that next. That became the line that like, that's made right. the sense. Like, the scene kind of click. So, that's right. It was all, all of the sort of misery of that day was worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so he heads off online, and I was thinking that's one of the biggest differences between the kind of fandom in this film versus High Fidelity, right? High Fidelity was sort of, there's a community there. The record store was an anchor and a center of gravity for a lot of different people, and it didn't seem quite as pathetic as um, you know, D Duncan staring at his computer screen, mm. ignoring his wife. Mm -hmm. were, you, were you thinking of that as you were putting this film together, about how that's changed? There's been a, such a shift? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, like, I think that was part of what was, part of what, was exciting is that obviously this novel had the benefit of Nick's um, Nick's really precise observation about like human behavior and in particular about males like him who are um, who are unhealthily obsessed with music. But this is the first. This was really, in a way, like the first um, one where he really stood out, and it was like written from right. more from the from a female's perspective, and where I think he had a sort of critical eye on himself of how those obsessions can be incredible, somewhere between frustrating and destructive. Mm. You know, yeah. mm. um, and I think to me that was it was exciting in that book to see that perspective, and it also seemed in a weird way like a funnier, a funnier thing to be able to yeah. delve into this character as a guy who's destroying his life through his ridiculous obsession. Yeah, and um, at, some, at a certain point, Rose, your character sort of has to take on responsibility for explaining this when Tucker Crow comes to town. So we've got a clip we can show you, a little, another little taste of the film where uh, Rose's character is, is, uh, um, finds out that Tucker has discovered the room. <laughs> I love I love the laugh at the end of that scene, which which is the kind of laugh that makes Notice you think that, yeah. maybe she is that going to cut his head off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Takes a turn. Yeah, I know. I remember watching it last night. We we had like the premiere last night, and it's you forget that like nobody has any idea about anything, right? Like nobody has any idea what the movie is, and it could have been that movie. Like there was a, I was like that. Like, <laughs> Where people are like, oh, maybe that's what this movie is. Yeah. <laughs> that she's going to kill this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which would be so exciting. Anything could happen. Like, could it's hard to Stephen make that King. work in the edit now. Yeah. Like, we probably have to release it where she doesn't kill him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. 
as you, I mean, as you're trying to, you say, and your character has a lot, it's not just about this obsession with pop culture. So he's sort of, he's stuck in this past and this dream sort of teenage obsession uh, yeah. with a pop star. Um, your character is also uh, kind of stuck in the present, right? She's feeling stuck as well. But <coughs> you know, talk a little bit about how, what, what kind of, the difficulty she's facing, because she's kind of feeling like she needs to take some chances. Yeah, she doesn't take taken any risks, really, and she's buttoned up, and she's been, like, she works in a museum, and her, sort of, I think, like, her, her relationship has become an artifact as well. It's like a relic. It's just dead, and there's nothing to it, and, and, uh, and she starts to, like, re rebelliously protest and act out and write the scathing review, then reach out to this, like, really unstable, bizarre rock star who's been, like, the bane of her existence, and start this like online flirtation and doing you know all these sorts of things and then they break up and the story goes on so it's um it it, it was and it, it obviously when you read the novel you get more of her inner narrative and we do a lot of voiceover in the film but um Tucker and uh Duncan are big characters so it was important to like make sure Annie has her defining moments and voice and all those sorts of things and because it's really seen through her eyes in the film i'd say in the book almost it's more you see it through everyone's eyes a little yeah. bit more whereas in the film it's yeah. a bit more annie's perspective yeah I think. yeah which was um and you know it's very funny he's very with i mean obviously he's so brilliant and it's a, as jesse said it's such a gift having the characters from the book already as an actress to or mm -hmm. an actor to you know to, to to have that already when you start the process of figuring out who they are and everything. So. But at the same time, these two people are um, two of the great improvisers and a lot of the funniest stuff um, was not in the book or on the script or in the script, so. That's great. Yeah. I mean, they're so good together. And I, and, and I would imagine in terms of, there are, there are these characters in the books, but one of the most fun ones to reinvent must have been creating your own rock star, right? I mean, you've, you've got to record snippets of music. You get to pick all the great photos of Ethan Hawke with various <laughs> facial, facial <laughs> hair. And look. How, and was, how was he about the photos, too? Was he, was he offering up the most possibly embarrassing um, photos he could find, or no, were you digging he, those up yourself? We, I think that our art department dug those up. He was not <laughs> very, he wasn't very forthcoming. <laughs> I think he also, in, in fairness, I think his life was in storage because he had, there was some issue with his house and they had to move out. So when I asked for old photos, he was like, find them online, I don't know, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's that. So basically it was um, our art department digging, digging around and trying to find ones that people didn't know that well. And mm -hmm. you know, and I think actually we found a, a bunch of ones that weren't like hugely recognizable yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And when you went um, to, to figure out what the music was gonna sound like, you went out to a number of musicians, is this right? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for me, that was the most stressful part of this project because it just felt, it felt like um, you know, for, for Nick writing a novel, he had the benefit of being able, you didn't have to, he, he didn't have to present the music so that he, you know, in the novel, you leave it to the reader to be able to, you know, project what they want that cult record to sound like, um, the way that we all have here. And, uh, but, and, and I even like went through a phase of trying to figure out, is there a way to make this movie without hearing the record? But we realized like we needed to, we needed to make the record. Um, and it was, but it was a really daunting task. But I think you know we had a great music supervisor and um, a good old friend of mine who's composed almost all of the movie stuff I've done, who was in rock bands, and so he produced the record and composed all the music for um, for the movie. But we went out to probably seventy five um, singer songwriters, um, and we would send them briefs and say like, we can't promise, will you, you know, we sort of describe what the narrative of the record was and the narrative of the character and the period that it was supposed to be in and say like, we can't promise we'll use your song, but if we do, we'll pay you a little money. And I thought no one is gonna like, I thought it'll just be like a bunch of like kids, desperate kids who like would send in songs, but we actually got amazing, amazing submissions. And, um, and in the end we have a song from uh, Ryan Adams, from, uh, Connor Oberst from Robin Hitchcock. Um, you know, so we got some. And were they doing great. full songs, or were you look at you? Were you telling people we're only going to use a little bit of this here, a little bit? Yeah, of but we there. would get full. We yeah. would get. We there. You know, ultimately they were full full songs, and then we would choose. You know, which parts to okay. use. And there'll be like a. Will there be a soundtrack? A, there is a soundtrack. Oh, I believe comes out tomorrow. All right. Yeah. All right. The first um, song got released today. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, which is the first It was the ever. Connor Oberst. So you, you hear Connor Oberst's demo that he sent us 
and then um, and then one of the two versions that um, the Juliet version of that same song and it, and all the music in it was sung by Ethan and yeah, it was fun. That's yeah. fantastic. And um, we'll show you one more one last clip. Um, we've got a scene where it all kind of comes to a head. Um, Duncan and uh, Ethan Hawke's character, everyone's at the table together. Um, I've got to say this is one of my favorite scenes of the film because it gets at the core of like what I do for a living, right? It's like trying to make sense out of somebody else's work. Yeah. And it kind of builds to this big crescendo where Duncan's character says, you know, uh, you know, Ethan Hawke's character is very upset. Duncan's character says, art is no more for the artist than water is for the plumber. So, so the question I have for you is, like, why are we even talking to you here tonight? You know, like what, like what, you know, why should we care what you think about your own work if it's going to be ours? Do you, do you at a certain point get frustrated with this dialectic between <laughs> journalists and critics and what you're doing? Do you, do you think it's worthwhile? Do you think that discussion? I mean, I'm a fan, so I love reading, you know, if I see a, uh, you know, Nick Hornby doing an article about a novel, I'll read it. You know, I'm as much of a fan as, as anyone would be in the audience who's, you know, or you guys or whatever. So, but does it get... I think at the end of that scene, the, the more important part that not that it, it, it's more important in Ethan at the end of that scene, his character dismisses his own work mm -hmm. and says, the fact that you enjoy it is ridiculous because I hate it. And that's, I think, what I, uh, my character can't understand. And I'm like, you don't get to decide how good the work is just because you made it. So like we can, I can be interested in your opinion as a journalist and all of your opinion of the work. Um, and I can't dismiss my work. If I feel like uh, I, I did a movie and I, and I didn't like it, I would never, I've never, I've actually never slagged off a movie I've ever done for that kind of reason, even though it was like, it's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I made it. And if maybe some of them were better than others and whatever, and we're all part of the enjoyment of the thing once we kind of put it out there. But I think as an artist, you don't get to dismiss it once you've given it to everybody else. That seems unfair. That's like, that's when you're breaking the rules, I think, of engagement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, and that's, I think, what my character in the movie responds poorly to because Ethan's like, I made this movie 20 years, or I made this album 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and it means nothing to me now. And I'm like, well, I, I don't like it because you like it. I like it because I like it. And yeah, and, and you know, water is whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I think that's important. Like, I think that's an interesting thing that we talk about in the film in terms of who does art belong to after the but what after if you regret created. making something? Because I think part of him regrets doing it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but he's so, not ponying up at the at that t in that yeah. scene, yeah. and so. Yeah. But uh, it's a wider thing. Here. I don't know. What do you think? If you regret no, making no, something, yeah, if you regret making something, it's hard to not dismiss it and wish people hadn't. I think it's hard to stand it. up for it, mm. but I think if uh, I've made things. Every now and again, people come up to me and talk about things that I don't really even have a relationship with mm. anymore. And I'm like, I'm so glad you like it. I feel like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like that's, like we definitely didn't, 
make it in a vacuum. I have no interest in making things that are for no one. Um, it feels always yeah. so kind of false when I hear actors or any kind of artist talk about stuff and they're like, I don't care if anybody ever sees it. I'm like, that's horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you could have just done it in your living room for your parents. <laughs> <laughs> if it was so important for you that people not enjoy it, there was a lot of ways to do that. <laughs> <laughs> people are, I think that sometimes people um, and artists are so worried about being interpreted as commercialist that they will um, ridicule any work that's successful. And that to me seems um, disingenuous. Mm. Right, right. I, it seems to me like this this cycle of this discourse, right, like that has accelerated so much online, like sort of folks like yeah, Duncan, of course, and they, yeah. you know, I'm sure it's Sundance, you, you walked out of that, that premiere screening, yeah. and I'm, Twitter was just filling yeah. with responses yeah. immediately. Yeah. Does it feel diff like it's something yeah, changing? Yeah, of course, it's like the best thing about social media is everyone can have a, an opinion, and the worst thing about social media <laughs> is that everyone <laughs> right, right, right. can have an opinion, no? Because it's like, you get, it's a lot of noise, yeah. a lot of noise, so it's about what you choose to listen to, and but it's changed the game, of course. Like information is so fast, and people's opinions are so immediate. And and uh, I, yeah, I'm I'm like everybody figuring out how to process it and deal with it. Yeah. But it's definitely brand new to Instagram. We were just saying yes. two weeks <laughs> two weeks old on Instagram. Yeah. Are you on Instagram hey. now? Yeah. Oh yeah. She broke yeah. down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it. <laughs> yeah, I'm already getting anxiety about it. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> no. Is it that? Mo I mean, you know, I. I Always like when I'm talking to directors and they're in the final stage, the final cut, or you're visiting them in the edit suite and they're trying to get things just right so that the film hits just the way they want it to. And then you see it splinter into a thousand different reactions and people, and, you know, and factions warring over what the movie means. I'm sure you've all been through that experience. Have you had experiences yeah. where that's really surprised you? Where you've made a film and thought it was going to be received one way and then been confronted with something else? Yeah, I'll, I, I'm, I'm sure you. Well, you never know how it's going to be yeah. received. This is, is the first. I mean, I think I'm inherently pessimist, so I just <laughs> I, if anything, like try to like break. You know, I break try to keep. Head. I try to brace myself slash stay away from like hearing too much. But then, of course, I have a sick curiosity that um, counters that. But yeah. I think I, I think at the end of the day, for me, the kind of things that I really, the kind of like movies and TV shows that I love are the kind of things that. Um, that uh, where the me where like the meanings of certain things that are going on, I like I'm sort of attracted to things that aren't where you're not being super clear, where you're not clearly telling people how to experience something and leaving things ambiguous or or um, um, I'm having a hard time articulating. It, but I kind of but so I kind of like things that I think have a lot of room for interpretation, and I so then. I expect in that process that some people are going to see it the way I wanted them to, and some people are going to see it totally differently. And and I feel like, oh, well, that's the pitfall of the kind of things that I that I'm drawn to making in the way, mm -hmm. yeah, you know. Um, and I your feel work like, on Girls, directing uh, some episodes of Girls, that's a show that people love to argue about. Yeah. Online. And it, the nice thing about TV, of course, is as a director, you don't feel as responsible for people's negative <laughs> responses. But, um, but yeah, but like you sort of like embrace, I don't know, I sort of, if I can be zen about it, I like sort of embrace the fact that like it's having the desired effect where people are experiencing it um, in different ways. And, um, and there's like room for interpretation just like there is in sort of anything in, in life. Yeah, Chris and Rose. I, it, it strikes me like there's something interesting about being that you know that teenager who has an obsession with Kylie, mm -hmm. or um, and then becoming someone, knowing that somebody else out there has kind of got those posters of you on on her wall. Mm -hmm. it, it, is what does that feel like to just live with that and know that those kind of fans coming up to you might have the Tucker Crow room <laughs> down in the basement, <laughs> the Rose Byrne room. <laughs> I don't. I, uh, I don't think about it. And I guess yeah. because I feel like that sort of, and I'm not just trying to be like humble, and but I do think that rabid fandom is sort of kind of reserved really for like a few movie stars and musicians. I think musicians are just capture a moment in your life and time and the whole, like 
the, there's, some, there's something about them that is elevates them to a different level of being an idol rather than just a, well, you know an actress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that yeah, like you know, you know, I'm not famous. Like Selena Gomez is famous. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, so that that's just, I don't yeah I don't I can't. I can't, in good faith, put myself in that category. <laughs> Why do we think that is that musicians? Because I've definitely, yeah, I've reported on big movie stars and then big pop stars, and, and the, the the amount of screaming going on around like, Rihanna versus you know a huge movie stars, mm. you can't compare. You can't compare. You know, it is yeah, really like different. I, my this is a, my parents who are like in their seventies. The Beatles came to Australia in the fifties, like, and they booked the gig before they became really famous, and then the, you know, then they just became the biggest band in the in the world. Everyone's heard of the Beatles, mm -hmm. and um, anyway, they went to the concert, and for two hours straight, everyone stood on their chairs, and you couldn't hear them because they were <laughs> screaming for two hours straight so loudly. The go oh, everybody, they, they couldn't hear a song, didn't hear anything. Yeah. <laughs> the pitch was so high for two hours straight. That's why they stopped that playing. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. It stopped playing because they said we couldn't hear ourselves play anymore. Yeah. They played Candlestick Park in San Francisco, and people were shouting so loud, we were like, we can't even hear the music. <laughs> so it's, uh, and, and, but it is, it's fascinating. Like, there's definitely more of an emotional connection, I think, with, with music, with musicians than there are with actors, for, for probably a couple of reasons. Mm. One, I would say, is musicians are being themselves, and by definition, we're being someone else. So it's probably less interesting or less enthralling and engaging. And also... But are they being themselves? Or are they, they're, they're also well, people think that they're being... Well, they're putting themselves. forward some version of a, of a, of a something mm. that people can cling on to, whereas with every job, we're putting forward some version of a something else than ourselves, otherwise we're doing a bad thing. <laughs> and I feel like then there's also... Music is just so... like. Uh, I, I do this show, this Get Shorty show, and they have, um, we've got this great guy who does the music called Antonio Sanchez, who also did the music for um, Birdman, and he works in drums, and, uh, and it's, uh, his whole thing is drums. And they decided to use his stuff because they didn't know what the tone of the show was going to be comedically or if, or if it was going to be more dramatic. And the drums are like tonally ambivalent. Like there, you, if you use the drums, it doesn't say this is going to be a funny moment. Or a, but if you use anything with a melody, mm -hmm. it's much more difficult. And it's kind of like that, where like the actual melody or a, a beat or something is so much more. Um, it resonates in a far more kind of arcane or um, human way, I suppose, than like words mm -hmm. and therefore I think that people can it, it's it's kind of it's beyond words like and that's why it works so well internationally because you know you're drawn into like the actual sound like it's drums it's like mm. it's in your soul and therefore like music will always be more powerful in that way mm -hmm. particularly when you're a teenager and you haven't found your words Mm -hmm. You know, right. you're kind of still coming to terms with how you're going to express yourself in any kind of way of verbosity. And, but you can have this, this, these beats or melodies running through you, and you're going to connect to that if that connects with you. Mm -hmm. right. So that's why people shout at Rihanna. <laughs> yeah. are, you, are you listening to that thinking, maybe I should have stayed with the music? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, a little time for questions. So if you raise your hand, we'll start right here. We'll get you a microphone if you just wait for a second. And um, there we go. Yeah, we've got a live stream going on, so that's oh, why the useless I get it. microphone. Okay. Yep. Um, my question is about regret. Um, uh, you know, I know people that you know when they meet their heroes, they regret having met them. And th this is a question for you as well. Oh, for. <laughs> Um, have you ever uh, felt that way after having met a hero, or have you met your hero that you know you regret meeting? That's a good question. Hmm. I, I had my I had a, like a when I first became a journalist. I grew up in North Carolina, pretty far away from anybody who did the things I read about and listened to, and it was really exciting for me moving to New York. Um, and all of my first experiences 
uh, ended up pretty amazing. And I, and I, had the, I started editing theater, so you know, stuff like the Phil, Phil Hoffman call. Um, but I, within about three months, I was working at New York Magazine, and I had interviewed you know, Arthur Miller and Edward Albee and oh. Kurt Vonnegut, and I had just kind of gone down to Terry Gilliam. I mean, it was, it was all in my first six months, and I just felt so thrilled to meet all of them. That my, so my, what comes to mind first is that I got so lucky. I mean, I remember having sort of Arthur Miller's home phone number and calling oh him God. to talk to him about things <laughs> sort of every other, every few weeks for a story. Um, and, and being really um, impressed by how some of my uh, idols, these people who had been taught in college, you know, were still so generous and, and kind of craving an audience in some ways. Like mm -hmm. Arthur Miller wanted to talk to people so bad. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, wow. How about you guys? Have you had that? Experience where you've been disappointed. Mine wasn't about being disappointed, but have you had? I, I have. I've definitely had Kylie? experiences where. Well, I did, but she was lovely. Yeah. She was so <laughs> lovely, and I was immediately that ten-year-old girl again. I was like rendered mute. Was like, yeah. <laughs> just did, couldn't talk, and she was yeah. so friendly and lovely. Couldn't have been sweeter. But I've definitely had experiences with other situations. But I think it's more on me than them because I think I get too anxious and um, and can't. Uh, can't sort of, yeah, cope. <laughs> I'm definitely, I, I, yeah, that thing where you feel like I, this is my one shot. Yeah, 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 exactly. It wasn't a moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what you. I didn't. I, I've never really. I, I, what I've been, what I found interesting about like working in our industry is that I've been surprised by how, like, the more famous the person is or the more successful generally the more genial and kind they are to people. And that's kind of, of course, why they end up in this kind of position in the first place. The only one time that I was like, oh, this didn't go as well as I had hoped, I met Shane McGowan, who's the lead singer of The Pogues. <laughs> and um, we were at an award ceremony together. And uh, it was like a black tie event, but it was kind of late in the evening. And we like taking our jackets off and we'd done a bit of a boogie and somebody from like, I think his manager or someone came over to me and said, you know, that Shane McGowan is a, he's a, he's a big fan of yours. He'd love to meet you. And I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so he brought me over to, um, to Shane McGowan and I was sat next to him and I kind of rabbited on for a bit and I was telling him, he's kind of like, I don't know what you'd call it. It's kind of like Irish punk music or something, but I was telling him that it meant a lot to me, and I t kind of talked to him for a bit, and he wasn't a big chatter, and that was fine. <laughs> so I kept talking for ages. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, eventually he said, um, yeah, I'll have a vodka tonic. <laughs> <laughs> And I realized he thought I was the waiter. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea who I was. <laughs> Uh, and it was, you know, like it, it, initially it was, of course, disappointing. Um, but also, I was like, how cool that he let me talk at him <laughs> for so long. And also, I need to get his drink now. <laughs> uh, so that's the only time that I felt like I haven't done myself justice. <laughs> Jesse, you have one? Um, it was pr probably, I think it was like during the 2008 camp Democratic campaign, and I'd been obsessed with Keith Olbermann and how <laughs> I thought he, I thought his, like he was like my catharsis through all the years of the Iraq War and Bush. And I had just done a movie with Jason Bateman and I had talked to Jason about like, you know, how obsessed I was with Keith Overman, and I knew they were like on a fantasy baseball team together. And so he arranged a, he arranged a triple date um, <clears throat> when he came to New York with um, the three of us and our three wives, and, um, and the three wives sat on one side of the table, and I sat there, um, you know, across from Jason next to Keith Overman. So psyched to talk about politics, break down this new guy, Obama, and like whatever, and literally, he had no desire to talk to me or talk about politics. <laughs> oh, All they oh. did was talk about sports the entire time. <laughs> and it was such a huge disappointment. Oh. Like, I, I was so pumped up to get his, oh, like, no. insight. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You have these huge expectations. Even if it's a good experience, yeah. often they can't match up. Who else has got a question? We'll pass the mic around. 
over here. We'll get you a mic. Just hold on a second. Thank you. I was curious about your uh, relationship or your appreciation for comedy and humor in your work. You both seem very naturally funny, and I wondered if that was something that was validated in you as a young person or a young actor, if that's a genre that you feel drawn to. Obviously, this movie has some very serious themes that are told through the lens of, of sort of the humor aspect, but I wondered if you could talk about your connection to that. Uh, well, I, um, I'm the youngest of four, so I guess that means you're always a bit of a goofball, but um, <laughs> I was very shy when I was little, very, very shy. And I, didn't, I did act, started acting because to get out of my shell, basically, to, so, which is always sounds strange when you're an actress to, the, the, you know, you came at it as a very shy kid. And then, um, it's funny though, with comedy, often, just because if you're a funny person doesn't mean you're a funny actor, and if you're a funny actor doesn't mean you're a funny person. And that's like the number one rule that I think mm. is very yeah. intriguing to me still. Like you meet so many funny actors or comedians who are very serious, very yeah. serious people. And Particularly yeah. stand-ups. Yeah. 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 Very serious. And that's fascinating to me. Um, but I think culturally Australia is, you know, we have a good sense of humor the same with Ireland. Um, and personally, for me, it's the same. It's, I mean, doing comedy is like doing drama, but on top of that, you have to get a laugh. So it's just the same thing. It's, it's just as dramatic, if not more, because the stakes have to be, have to be high for it to be funny. And I, I personally think it's difficult, but working with people like Chris O'Dowd or Kristen Wiig or Melissa McCarthy or Seth Rogen, they make it look effortless, you know, effortless. Um, and that's, um, I'm always like envious of that, because I, 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 I work, to do, you know, I'm still like trying to, still doing, I definitely don't just sort of, like, um, I'm, I'm trying to come right. up with ideas. Rose is so like, funny in this movie. I, I was watching it last night and I was, I, she's so funny. Like I, I, I can't work out if you're being self-deprecating or if you're being honest. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because it's like her skill, at, and weirdly, and this is kind of going to sound pathetic, but <laughs> um, like, uh, I was watching TV a few weeks ago, like during the day, and Bridesmaids was on. <laughs> and it was like the scene where she's kind of doing the, I'm an ugly crier in the car. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so good. <laughs> like, it's so good. Like, she's so comedically astute, and she can do anything, which it's kind of. Um, it's hard, it's hard to do everything, but she's one of the few people I've ever kind of worked with or met who I'm like, oh, you can, m m maybe, it, maybe you find it effortful, <laughs> but you do it so sublimely. It's oh, really that's incredible. Oh, so you to say that. <laughs> I don't know, I, oh, okay. Oh, sure. Come on, how, you're very sweet to say. How about a question from this side? Shy on that side, right, right there. Hold on, we'll get you a mic. Hi there. Hi. I haven't seen the movie, but I read the book. And I was wondering if when you read the book or any of Nick Hornby's books, that you actually saw yourself playing one of the characters if it ever became a film. I read it in 2009 and loved it. Loved it when it came out. It's my favorite novel of his. And one of those books that you read and then you want to tell everyone to read it. Like, I just read a great book. You've got to get it. Um, and at the time, I was pretty, I didn't, I didn't. I was so caught up and swept up in the narrative. I, d I was so in my imagination of who these people were that I, d I had pictured myself. But when, the, when I heard that it was being made, I was like, oh my goodness, if I would get the chance to do that, it would have been like so fun and so exciting and daunting too to try to bring her to life. Uh, but I don't know about you, Chris, if you have that, had um, that experience. I still have it in my heart that I'm going to play the lead in High Fidelity. <laughs> <laughs> may have missed that boat. But weirdly, I've, I've just finished working with Nick Hornby again on something else. And, um, and I, I keep telling him um, that now I'm starting to feel like his muse. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I said it, I've said it to him a couple of times. And his reaction has been the same, where he's laughed at the joke and then not responded and walked off. <laughs> um, 
But I feel very um, familiar and connected to the kind of male characters that he, that he writes, um, in that there is certainly some arrested development there and um, kind of on the outskirts of obsession, I suppose you would call it, but also that they know that they need to be better emotionally. Um, which makes, I, which elevates them from a lot of other kind of writers that there is an, I think there is an awareness there that we need to be better men and we can't just um, please ourselves with our interests. Um, but I hadn't read the book before we had, uh, I actually, I had read the, I read the book before I read the script, but the script had come in and I thought, oh, well, I'll read the book before I have it because I've actually got a week to like work it out. And then I read the script, and I was like, it's the best version of the book. And I'm not just saying that because I'm, I, I'm in the film. <laughs> I would just not say it. <laughs> uh, but I thought it's a really strong adaptation of it. Like, they've really taken all of the best stuff and, and put it on the screen, which is obviously what you, what you want. Mm. Another question? Right here. Um, sort of a follow-up to that, when you're adapting from a book and a book that you're a fan of, how do you sort of walk the line or what are some of the challenges in being true to the source material and knowing when you need to shed it and just make the film something other than the book? Um, well, f for, to start with, well, no, that's actually not true. <laughs> I was about to say this is the, but it's not, this wasn't the first time I did something that was adapted. but. Um, but actually, the first one I did was adapted from a short story, so it was actually the opposite process of, I love the short story, and we sort of expanded from it. Um, I do think, on some level, I think, um, at least from my own little experience with this one, is just, is just, um, just trying to like track the things that are really moving you and the things that seem to like fit together and um, and really trying to, and, and invariably, there's way more, even when you do your first concept of like, we'll lose this, we'll lose this, we'll combine these three characters into this character and whatever, and invariably it's still too much. But I think there is, I mean, it's why, um, I, I think a lot of times people think like, oh, adapting a book must be easier than original screenplay because you have like all these great words and you have these characters and you understand what, they, you're, what they're feeling and thinking. but. In effect, it's actually this process of just having to like whittle down and keep going back and forth and being like, how do we like still deliver the, how do we still deliver on like what people love about the novel, but without having all the space and the the space and and the ability to talk directly to you that you know that that a novel has so. I don't know. I mean, I'm not the right person to talk to, to do it. There's uh, to really answer that question, but um, it definitely is hard, you know. Uh, have the two of you read adaptations of novels? Yeah, I'm sure you get scripts, you send scripts all the time. Have you read an adaptation of a novel that you loved and just thought, "Oh, this doesn't work"? Is there, are there patterns to why those scripts don't work when you? God, I don't like know that? if I have. I don't know yeah. if I have. I've, Look. I've read a few pilots. Yeah. And that's always hard to judge because you can't see the whole series yet. Yeah. You know, like if it's being adapted from a from a book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's but not, not not lately. I haven't met. I haven't read. Yeah. I haven't read many novel adaptations like. I was yeah. you know, Jesse, you've directed a whole bunch of pilots recently. Glow and Divorce, and you've done a lot of other TV work as well. Um, but I I wanted to ask you, Chris, about this about North Hollywood. I did a, a, a list once. Uh, were you North Hollywood? The North Hollywood pilot. The Apatow? No. No, you weren't in that one. That may have been, you know, I get confused a lot with Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, that was the one. <laughs> I think I read you talking about a, a pilot that I don't know go why. with <laughs> Kevin Hart or something that I was Weird, thinking. I said that and then this laughter. It's strange. <laughs> it's strange. Uh. We, uh, there's one scene I really want to talk to you about before we wrap up. It's the <laughs> confession scene where um, Duncan is confessing to f having an affair. Right. And in his, uh, it it strikes me as just such a lovely scene. And he feels like he is doing the right thing. He's yeah. a very, you have a very soulful mm -hmm. look on your face. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be as the, as the most honest boyfriend you can be. Very noble. <laughs> <laughs> 
very noble in my confession. You know, it, you know what, in a wider point, like we kind of, we've talked so much tonight about like obsession with music and all of these things and, and that's natural because it's so past remarkable. And, but essentially this is a movie, really, this is Rose's movie about like, that we haven't necessarily kind of hit on that this is about a woman reaching an age where she needs to make a decision about her life about, um, you know, is this, I'm, am I going to stick or twist? And it suddenly comes down to that quite brutally because she's um, confronted with somebody who's cheated on her. And, um, and is developing um, a bit of a fantasy relationship with, that's right. with somebody else, but, there are, but it feels like it's never going to go anywhere. Another that. opportunity has arisen, even if it's fantastical. It's yeah. an, it's, it's somebody paying attention to you at a time when you, the person that you're with is not mm. is, a, is a very important kind of theme of the movie, I guess. Totally, yeah. It's about her getting, being seen again. You know? Yeah. She doesn't see her anymore. Like when you're in that long re relationship for so long, you, the person loses their physical shape in a way. And that's yeah. just not seen. So finally, this guy's like seeing her and engaging with her and likes her and like, what a great feeling to have that again you know yeah after so many years of just this like and we've all been there yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. no I do I confess uh, it's a funny it's it is a funny it is um oh god it's awful isn't it you know what? <laughs> I've never had to do that but like breaking up with someone even in a long-term relationship which I have done and feels at the time like a noble act, but like it feels like you're doing the right thing for everyone. <laughs> and of course it's not really. It's the right thing for you and you've tried to remaster this kind of <laughs> early demo version of a song into some kind of emotional resonance for everyone else. <laughs> and you're kind of telling them, hey, this is gonna be this is this is good. We need to we need to say this to each other. And they're kind of sitting there going, You've just fucking killed me mm -hmm. and, and your reaction in that scene is incredible you just seem so gobsmacked oh like, yeah so it is I mean it's like the the how do you respond to that mm -hmm. speech of you know him not not really apologizing for it you know, <laughs> it's extraordinary he's reasoning around it and in the book it's also a very funny sequence yeah today. yeah that's right. break up too um, but in a way it had to happen for her to, to get up and leave and be done yeah. You know, so it was, You're welcome. Of, it was a gift. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of getting up and leaving, um, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you guys so much. Thank uh, you, guys. Film Thank, you. Weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thanks. So great. I really enjoyed that. Thank, Again, you, thank you so much. Thank really you, guys. Fun. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.